Thank you very much for the introduction. President, fellows, and guests, it is a particular pleasure to speak about the Enlightenment to you today. Our society itself uh, is a child of the Enlightenment, and indeed, some of its fellows have shaped this intellectual movement through their work. More specifically, there was a very strong connection between the Society of Antiquaries and the field of study that we will be looking at in greater detail today, numismatics. In the 18th century, coins of various epochs played a fundamental role in the meetings of fellows, as we shall see a little later. But let me first set the scene. I propose to do so by analyzing the introduction to the first volume of the first periodical issued by our society, Archaeologia, or miscellaneous tracts relating to antiquity. The text was published anonymously in 1770, but as Hugh Tabin kindly informs me, it may be attributed to the antiquary Richard Goff, who was to become director of the society in 1771. This introduction contains a valuable historical account the society's development, but it starts off with more general considerations that help us understand the society's self-conception. At a time when the powerful movement of the Enlightenment was about two generations old, if we cautiously take the year 1700 as a starting point, it is of course impossible to pinpoint a particular year when the Enlightenment came into being initial phase may have begun around 1680. In any case, the opening lines of the introduction are as follows. Quote, the history and antiquities of nations and societies have been objects of inquiry to curious persons in all ages, either to separate falsehood from truth and tradition from evidence, to establish what had probability for its basis, or to explode what rested only on the vanity of the inventors and propagators." End quote. So, according to this text, the main goal of antiquarian research is the pursuit of truth. And this may be achieved by looking at the evidence as opposed to tradition, and by assessing the probability of things. These are not only key terms of Enlightenment scholarship, but needless to say, evidence and probability have remained fundamental concepts in the sciences and humanities ever since. The next page we read, quote, The arrangement and proper use of facts is history, not a mere narrative taken up at random and embellished with poetic diction, but a regular and elaborate inquiry into every ancient record and proof that can elucidate or establish them. For want of these, how large a proportion of history from the creation of the world to the present age remains yet to be sifted by the sagacity of modern criticism." End quote. This passage, the importance of the material evidence is reiterated. The author talks about ancient record and proof, and he postulates that there has to be a systematic analysis of it. He calls it regular and elaborate analysis, uh, sorry, inquiry. Uh, the material evidence has to be arranged properly in order to speak to us. These postulates are to be kept in mind for the main topic of this lecture, numismatics in the 18th century. And it may be mentioned in passing that the author, Richard Koch, took an active interest in numismatics. Furthermore, he refers to the sagacity of modern criticism, which is a telling testimony to the self-consciousness of the period. We will encounter the term criticism again a little later in a numismatic context. Finally, the author is confident that, quote, the antiquary will never be deemed an unserviceable member of the community, whilst curiosity and love of truth subsists. 
and least of all in an age wherein every part of science is advancing to perfection. End quote. People were, of course, very well aware that the Enlightenment had brought about something entirely new in intellectual history. And the fellows of the Society of Antiquaries, among them distinguished numismatists, were obviously proud of being part of this new movement. The journal Archaeologia contains several momentous numismatic papers, but the importance of coins to the society's life during the first 100 years or so of its existence is best illustrated by the minute books. Starting in 1717, 1718, these provide a record both of papers read to the society and of objects exhibited at the weekly meeting. In 2015, Hugh Fabian published an excellent paper about the role of the Society of Antiquaries of London in the advancement of numismatic research during the 18th century. It is based on a careful perusal of these minute books for the period from 1718 to 1800. And the second part of this article painstakingly lists the incredible wealth and diversity of coins and medals that were exhibited and discussed by fellows at their meetings. We do not have time to go into details here, but by far the longest entry in Hugh Pagan's list, which was organized by exhibitor or speaker, is for Martin Folks, president of the society from 1750 to 1754. He was the most assiduous contributor on numismatic matters, giving several papers and presenting ancient as well as medieval and modern coins. Uh, among numismatists, he's perhaps best known for his publication on English gold and silver coins. Other important numismatic contributors to the society's meetings were Charles Coombe, Andrew Colty Ducarel, Roger Gale, Samuel Pegg, and most notably, William Stuckman. Thus, at a time when there was no dedicated numismatic society in England, the Society of Antiquaries fulfilled this role as well. In this lecture, I intend to ask two main questions. Firstly, what was new about numismatics in the Enlightenment? As we've heard before, contemporaries were convinced that every part of science was advancing to perfection in the 18th century. But what did that mean for the study of coins? This question needs to be asked because numismatics had a particularly distinguished history by the late 17th and 18th century. The study of ancient coins goes back to the 15th century and had become an essential part of the classics since the 16th that generated an enormous bibliography by the time the Enlightenment started, around 1700. The claim that every part of science was advancing to perfection leads to my second question. What was the relationship between the study of coins and other fields of research in the Age of Enlightenment? What were the similarities in scholarly approach? And were there influences across disciplines? Greek and especially Roman coins are without doubt the best known class of portable antiquities. They are serial objects, were produced in incredible quantities, altogether millions and millions of pieces. Consequently, they have always been found in considerable numbers in the entire Mediterranean, continental Europe and in Britain in post-ancient times, whether as stray finds or as part of hordes which can number tens of thousands of specimens. The idea to produce systematic catalogues of the different types of ancient coins can be traced back to the mid-16th century, when the Austrian humanist Wolfgang Glatius was the first to announce such a project in 1558, although in the end nothing came of it. His contemporary, Adolf Ocko, who was a physician like Glatius, was more successful. Occo concentrated on Roman imperial coinage, and starting with Pompey the Great, um, published a remarkable listing of coin types, down to Byzantine times. The book first appeared in 1579, and Occo published a second edition in 1601. 
His work was enormously influential. Two somewhat reworked posthumous editions were published in 1683 and then as late as 1730, about one and a half centuries after the first edition. Occo's work is tangible proof of the humanist legacy that numismatists in the Enlightenment period had to deal with. Tradition has always been an important factor in scholarship, and numismatics is no exception. But, as we discussed previously, it was to some extent an enemy of enlightened scholars who set out, quote, to separate falsehood from truth and tradition from evidence, as we've heard before. One aspect that sets numismatics apart from many other disciplines is the strong influence of collecting on publishing and scholarship. Old coins, by their very nature and small size, lend themselves to being collected. And the study of coinages of the past obviously developed from coin collecting. However, collectors always love to assemble objects that share certain physical characteristics and form series. On this slide, I'm presenting a remarkable example of this approach to collecting. It is the so-called Codex Aureus of Emperor Charles VI of Austria, now kept in the coin department of the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. This is a precious coin cabinet in the shape of a codex with a manuscript title page, bound in purple velvet and decorated with gilt fittings. The title page is dated 1712 and the codex contained exclusively the ancient gold coins of the imperial collection, mainly Roman ori and solid, a series running from the late public, gold was minted, for example, by Sulla, Pompey the Great, and Julius Caesar, down to late antiquity. Similarly, collectors would put together series of, for example, denarii, standard silver coins of the Roman Republic and early Roman Empire, <coughs> or Cistercian, Large coins made of brass were introduced under Augustus and were a characteristic Roman denomination until the 3rd century AD. It was very popular to collect a series of different coins that were struck in the same metal and were of the same size. And this approach had a direct repercussion on numismatic scholarship and on publication strategies. A good example is furnished by a famous book by Charles Patin, Imperatorum Romanorum Numismata. It was first published in 1671 and reissued in 1696, thus at the very beginning of the Enlightenment period. The book is relevant in our context because Patin here does not focus on a specific time span of the imperial period or on a specific group of reverses as a historian or art historian would do today, perhaps. No, Patin focused on coins ex ere medie et minime forme, on bronzes of middle and small module, hence on coins below the value of the Cistercius. Thus, his approach is determined not primarily by chronological or typological considerations, but by formal criteria, the size and metal of the coins. This choice is evidently influenced by the practice of contemporary coin collecting. In French terminology, which was very influential in those days, such series were called suites, and the appeal was their morphological uniformity, in Papin's case, middle-sized and small bronzes. Indeed, most of the coins published in his book were from Papin's own collection. Patin's volume was a large folio, written in Latin, so it was aimed at educated readers, and it presented important new scholarship, despite the fact that its approach was dictated by collector's conventions, not by scholarly considerations. However, coin collecting was so popular by the late 17th century that pocket manuals were in great demand, small books in which laymen could learn about the basics of the discipline. The most successful of these short introductions to numismatics was first published in 1692 by a French Jesuit, Père Louis Jobert, under the title La Science des Médailles. Up 
to the mid-18th century, many reprints and two further editions of this work appeared in French, and it was translated into Latin, German, Italian, Spanish, and also English. The English edition was prepared by Roger Gay, fellow of the Society, who we've already mentioned earlier. His translation appeared in London in 1697, under the title The Knowledge of Metals. Translations into modern languages make the basics of numismatics easily accessible also to less educated collectors. In our context, it is important to note that Jobert felt the need to structure the enormous mass of different coinages to the classical world for his readership. For this purpose, he distinguished five orders of metals. Let me quote Gay's translation. Of these several heads, he refers to the obverses of the coins, are formed five different orders of metals, whereof may be composed very curious series. In the first, we may put the series of kings. In the second, that of cities, either Greek or Latin, before or since the foundation of the Roman Empire. In the third, may be ranged the Roman consular families. In the fourth, the imperium, and all that relates to them. In the fifth, the deities, of which we may have very agreeable series, either in simple bust, or else in their full proportion. Some heroes and illustrious persons are seen, yet preserved on medals. Homer, Pythagoras, and certain Greek and Roman captains. Quote. Hence, at the end of the 17th century, Jobert attempted to provide a rough classification of the whole of ancient coinage. The list is headed by the royal coinages, not by imperial ones, perhaps not only because the coins of kings were issued from a very early phase onwards, but also because Jobert's manual was written by a loyal subject of Louis XIV. Jean-Fois Vaillant, the most famous numismatist of his generation, was an exact contemporary of Jobert's. He was antiquary of the king and supplied the royal collection with large groups of ancient coins that he acquired during extensive travels in continental Europe, all of the Mediterranean and in the Levant. Vaillant was a most prolific writer. You can see this pile of books being just a small selection of his printed works. Several of them came classic handbooks of his day that continued to be reissued during about one generation after his passing. Perhaps his most successful publication was a work on Roman imperial coinage, first published in 1674. Final edition, three volumes, the three books, top of the pile, by the way, uh, appeared in 1743, almost 40 years after Vaillant's death. This work was hugely popular because it was, to some extent, geared towards coin collectors. Much like in the volume by Patin that we saw before, external criteria determine its structure. Roman imperial bronze coins and precious metal coins are treated separately, and the third volume of the 1743 edition lists extra-large pieces as well, Roman imperial medallions. Coin collectors could build the suites using Vaillant's publication as a guidebook, and it was helpful for them to find indications of rarity next to the descriptions of the single types. But apart from this work on Roman imperial coins, Vaillant published successfully on many other series of ancient coins as well. The Roman Republican coinage with two folio volumes in 1703, and the Roman provincial coinage coins with Latin legends, on Roman provincial coins with Greek legends, as well as on the history and coinage of various Hellenistic dynasties, Ptolemies, Seleucids, as well as the kings of Parthia, Pontus, Bosporus, and Bithynia. All of these books were monographic publications on the single orders and series of ancient coins that had been defined by the 17th century. But Vaillant never attempted a systematic overview. Change of scenery. We are in mid-18th century Vienna, 
where the Holy Roman emperors had put together a considerable collection of coins and medals over the centuries. As for ancient coinage, the collection was particularly strong in Roman imperium, because this was the tradition the Holy Roman emperors stood in. We have seen the Codex Aureus of Charles VI before, who took an active interest in numismatic studies. By 1750, the collection had grown to a proportion that necessitated a complete reordering. <coughs> and uh, in this year, the cabinet was also moved to a new location in the Vienna Hofburg. <laughs> this copper engraving shows the new setup of the imperial cabinet. It is taken from the sumptuous catalog, the ancient coins that was published after the reordering of the collection had been complete in 1755. This work was undertaken by a group of numismatists, headed by one of Vienna's most prominent scholars of the day, Jesuit Erasmus Fröhlich. He was a polymath who taught at the Theresianum, an elitist uh, educational institution founded by Maria Theresa in 1746. Today, Freud is best known for his numismatic studies, especially on Hellenistic coins. In our context, the Notitia Elementaris is relevant, a textbook on ancient coinage published in the final year of his life, 1758. In this work, Freud proposed a classification scheme for ancient coins that is much more comprehensive than the simple five orders of Jobert. Freud's system seems to have been developed during the process of reordering the imperial coin collection for the catalog I mentioned a minute ago. Uh, it is, this catalog is organized uh, according to a system that is not dissimilar to the one presented in the Notitia Elementaris. This was an important step forward, taken in the spirit of the Enlightenment. Freud <coughs> tried to come up with a detailed structure for the incredible mass of ancient coinage that has come down to us. However, despite his laudable intention, the classification Freud proposed is somewhat bewildering. <coughs> Let me mention just a few points. He kept some of the classes already established by Joubert. For example, the, for the class of regal coins, and the somewhat strange class of coins of famous men and women. In other words, coins featuring interesting heads, other than ruler portraits. Further classes of Freud's scheme are defined by, or arranged according to, formal criteria. Greek coins are ordered alphabetically by city name. Roman coins are divided by metal. Size is an important criterion too, as if larger coins were more important than smaller ones. For the arrangement of Greek and Roman provincial coins, the breakthrough was to be achieved just a few years after Freud had published his textbook. Not in Vienna, but in France. Joseph Pellerin, a high-ranking civil servant, had amassed the largest private collection of ancient coins of the 18th century. Towards the end of his long life, he sold it to the French king. Pellerin published selections from his ever-growing collection in the course of 16 years, between 1762 and 1778, in an imposing series of 10 catalogues. The decisive step taken by Pellerin in these Recueille was to group coins from mints in the same region together, in Europe, Asia, Africa, and the islands. He no longer ordered coins uh, alphabetically by mint name. Instead, Pellerin adopted a geographical presentation of his materials, started for Europe in the west with the coinage of Spain. In doing so, Pellerin basically followed the order chosen, chosen by the Augustan author Strabo in his geography. 
de la Vence thereby invented the geographical system that is used in arranging ancient Greek coins to this very day. Often coins produced in geographical proximity share certain features, whether technically or typologically. So this arrangement leads to a much better understanding of ancient coin production as a whole, as, as Pellerin remarked himself in one of his introductory essays. In 1774, at a time when Pellerin's catalogues were read and used with great excitement by coin collectors and classicists throughout Europe, a new director of the Imperial Collection of Ancient Coins was appointed by Maria Theresa in Vienna. It was Joseph Eckel, former Jesuit, then in his late 30s. A man who was to change the course of ancient numismatic scholarship forever and the archetypal numismatist of the Enlightenment. I have the privilege, together with a small team, to work on Eccles' correspondence, scholarly letters that he exchanged with several dozens of classicists, numismatists, and coin collectors throughout Europe. Uh, this material has not been studied before. We are preparing a critical edition with a commentary. Our project was developed in the framework of a new international initiative to publish manuscript sources for ancient numismatics from the period 1500 to 1800, called Fontesi Edici Numismatiche Antique Fina. On this slide, you can see a codex kept in Vienna into which the letters Eckel had received were bound in the 19th century. As was to be expected, these documents shed new light on Eccles' life and work, and one of the letters is particularly momentous in our context. It is a letter written by Eckel to an unknown Italian colleague in August 1775, in the second year of his directorship in Vienna, containing, containing a four-page treatise on the new arrangement of the coin cabinet of the Grand Duke of Tuscany in Florence. Anima versiones in metodum, secundum quam nunc digestum est museum numismaticum magni ducis. This is an arrangement for which Eccle was in part responsible himself. In 1772 and 1773, he was in Italy on a numismatic study and towards the end of his stay, he spent about five months in Florence, completely reorganizing the collection of ancient coins, together with the director of the Uffizi Gallery, Raimondo Cocchi. In their work, Eccle and Cocchi used the geographical arrangement proposed by Pellerin for the Greek and Roman provincial coins, and a strictly chronological arrangement for the Roman period coins. This uh, hitherto completely unknown letter of 1775 is the founding document of a new era in numismatic scholarship, the era of enlightened numismatic classification, as one might say. Formal criteria, like the size of the coins, or the metal in which they were struck, did not have a bearing on numismatic arrangement anymore. The coins of kings, were inserted where they belonged geographically by Eckel, as were the coins of heroes and famous men and women. In short, for the Greek coins, Pellerin's system was adopted with modifications, whereas Froelich's obsolete classification was jettisoned more or less completely. The decision to adopt an innovative classification system created a lot of additional work for Eccle in his capacity as curator of the imperial collection. Thousands and thousands of coins that Freudlich and his colleagues had rearranged according to Freudlich's system just about 20 years earlier, in the early 1750s, had to be reordered. Eccle documented this reorganization of the collection in a new two-volume catalog, reflecting the new system the Catalogus 
Musee Cesare was published in 1779, five years after he had taken up this position. Fine labels of uh, this copy of the catalog in a contemporary binding prominently feature the indications Paris Prima and Paris Secunda. First part was the catalog of the Greek and Roman provincial coins. Second, catalog of the Roman Republican and Imperial coins. But in this case, parts one and two do not only stand for the numbering of the two volumes of the catalog. They also reflect the terminology <laughs> of Italy's new system of organizing ancient coinage. As mentioned before, Erasmus Brody had used the term classes in his reign. Etty distanced himself from Brody terminologically by avoiding this word. Instead of 15 classes, the numismatic legacy of the ancient world was divided into two partes in Eccles' reconstruction, into the non-Roman coins, to be ordered geographically, and the Roman coins ordered chronologically wherever possible. This is a very simple structure. From the model point of view, it has certain problems, of course. It does not allow for the classification of ancient coins from Xum, India, or China, for example. And closer to home, it is very difficult to fit in Celtic coins as well, which were not at the center of Eccles' interest. However, the system provides a comprehensive and crystal clear framework for the classification of ancient Greek and Roman issues. At the time of the publication of his catalogue of ancient coins in the Imperial Collection in Vienna in the 1770s, Eckel had already started writing a new work on the whole of Greek and Roman coinage. Such a general, yet at the same time detailed overview had never been produced before in the history of numismatic scholarship. This work was based on his new system of classification, which he had devised during his time in Italy. It was published in eight quarto volumes in Vienna in the final seven years of Eckel's life, between 1792 and 1798, and is universally regarded as his, his master as the crowning achievement of Enlightenment numismatics. The work was published under the now famous title Doctrina Numorum Veterum. Like the two-volume catalogus of 1779, its structure is symmetrical. The first four volumes cover part one of Eccles' system in non-Roman ancient coins, and the other four cover part two. Roman points. Our research on Eccles' correspondence makes it possible to follow his work on the doctrina over the years, and we found out that the choice of title was a last-minute decision. It is not clear why he changed his mind in 1792. From 1786 onwards, Eccles had planned to call his Markham opus Ars Critica Numaria instead. If he had kept this version, the Enlightenment spirit exuding from every single of the thousands of pages of this work would have been heralded also in the title. Criticism was, of course, another watchword of the Enlightenment. We encountered the term at the beginning, in the introduction to the first volume of Archaeologia, where mention is made of the sagacity of modern criticism. The Doctrina Numorum Veterum made Eccle world famous. Through critical examination of the evidence, he was able to eliminate a great many fakes and fantasy pieces that had been marring the reliability of numismatic works since the 16th century, the time of Lazius and Occo. By means of Eccle's new arrangement, ancient coinage as a whole, for the first time, became fully usable as a source for history and for art disciplines, as Eccles' colleagues across Europe immediately recognized. Consequently, the Doctrina became the most influential work on ancient coinage of all times. 
It summed up the entire previous research and provided the basis and starting point for studies of Greek and Roman coins for the following centuries. In 1901, Ernest Babylon famously called it Toujours notre grammaire in the historical overview of his Traité de Monnaie Grecque et Romaine. This medal was struck in Vienna in 1837 for the centenary of Hitler's birth is dedicated to him as the founding father of the system of ancient coinage, Systematis Rei Numariae Antiquae Contori. The reverse of the medal depicts Minerva, the patroness of the arts, as she crowns one volume of the Doctrina Numorum Metal. This depiction gives an idea of the veneration in which Eckel and his work were held in the 19th century. Eckel died in 1798. The most significant victory for him was written by the French natural scientist, archaeologist, and numismatist Aubin Louis Mien de Grand Maison, who was the keeper of the Cabinet des Médailles in Paris from 1795 onwards. In this obituary, Mien specifically acknowledged the contribution that Eckel had made to the development of numismatic methodology. Mien, as a natural scientist, underlines that in English, in English translation, the method that he introduced into one branch of archaeology, that is to say, to numismatics, is closely related to scientific method regarding the way in which objects are classified. Mien concludes, il est le réformateur de la science numismatique comme Linnaeus a été celui de la science de la nature. He is the reformer of numismatics, just as Linnaeus was the reformer of natural science. In view of Mian's background, it is easy to see why he came up with this comparison. Mian was an enthusiastic supporter of Linnaeus and one of the principal founders of the short-lived Société Linnéenne de Paris, which was established in 1787, but ceased to exist in its original form in 1790. It was thus outlived by the Linnaean Society of London, one of our sister societies here in Burlington House, by 230 years and counting. Mian was not the first to make this comparison between Linnaeus and Eccle, to be sure, maybe traced back to the 1780s in a different and somewhat unclear context. However, the passage quoted before, Duncan was responsible for the comparison gaining currency in the 19th century, when it was repeated time and again in texts about Eccle. Linnaeus and Eccle were contemporaries. The Swedish naturalist was 30 years older and died 20 years earlier than the, the Austrian numismatist. No direct context between the two men are attested. There is no evidence for an immediate impact of Linnaeus' work on Echo, but of course they share a common approach on a general level, as Mian's comparison on the line. Either of them set out to systematize a huge body of material thereby providing a new basis for subsequent research. The main work of Aeneas is the Systema Naturae, first published in 1735, which went through no fewer than 12 editions in the author's lifetime alone. The title runs as follows. Systema Naturae, Sive. Regna tria naturae systematicae proposita per classes, origines, genera, et species. Eccle did not take up this title in his work, but contemporaries were quick to coin the term Systema Ecceliana. This was clearly influenced by the title of Linnaeus' famous book, Systema Naturae, or by the term Systema Linneanum, current since the 18th century. The earliest prominent 
attestation of the term Systema Echelianum goes back to Echel's lifetime, when in 1797, the Italian numismatist Domenico Sestini published a book on Greek coins based on the first four volumes of the Doctrina. In what may be a double allusion to Linnaeus, he called his work Classes Generales, Geographia Numismatica, and indicated in the subtitle that he had laid out the material according to Eccles' arrangement, Secundum Systema Echelianum. Eccles' endeavor to provide an all-encompassing handbook on ancient coinage is an enlightenment project par excellence. As a cornerstone in its field, the doctrina may thus be regarded to be on a par not only with Linnaeus's Systema, but also, for example, with Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language of 1755. Another great work uh, of the Enlightenment in the field of the classics was, of course, Johann Joachim Winkelmann's enormously influential Geschichte uh, der Kunst des Altertums, first published in 1764 in Dresden. As we read in the preface, the purpose of Winkelmann's book was not much different from Eccles' Doctrina, namely to provide a systematic overview in true and London spirit. Let me quote the key passage in the English translation by Andrew Lodge. Quote, the history of ancient art which I have undertaken to write is not a mere chronicle of epochs and of the changes which occurred within them. I use the term history in the more extended signification which occurs in the Greek language, and it is my intention to attempt to present a system. Now, in German, the term Wittmann uses is Lehrgebäude. Hence, for ancient art, uh, Winkelmann's project had a scope similar to that of Eccles for numismatics. The Geschichte der Kunst des Altertums was a book that Eccle, of course, knew very well and occasionally cited in Doctrina, not always approvingly. Winkelmann used numismatic evidence in his text, but did not have expert knowledge on coins, so that he often misused coins as sources as Eccle censoriously remarked in one passage. May, however, have drawn inspiration from the five periods that Winkelmann defined in his reconstruction of the chronological development of Greek and Roman art from the beginnings to late antiquity. Curiously enough, Eccle opts for five periods as well in his reconstruction of the overall development of Greek and Roman coinage from the invention of coinage up to the Emperor Gallienus in the introduction to volume one of the Doctrina. Yet there is no real correspondence between his chronological divisions and Winkelmann's, other than the numerical conformity of five periods overall in that case. Nor is there a reference to the Geschichte der Kunst in this passage of the Doctrina. To conclude, Hickel's numismatic work must doubtless be understood in the context of many other landmark projects of the Enlightenment, in the classics and beyond. At the same time, his doctrina and more generally the creation of the Systema Echelianum was very much an undertaking sui generis. Thank you very much.